Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Birmingham Public Schools Board of Education study session. Today is Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. My name is Kim Whitman, and it's my privilege and honor to serve as the school board president for the 2020-2021 school year. Again, welcome to all of those of you watching us on YouTube. We, um, we do have an exciting meeting again today. However, our first role of business is roll call. So Joan, I will turn it over to you, please. Thank you. Trustee Angeloni? Present. Trustee Holcomer? Here. Trustee Jennings? Trustee McKinney? Here. Trustee Rass? Here. Trustee Whitman? Present. And Trustee Young? Here. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Allow the minutes to show that six trustees are in attendance. Uh, before we move on to our next order of business, I want to officially welcome Dr. George Height. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you, uh, thank you for uh, being our interim superintendent uh, for the next uh, time period. Um, our next order of business is public comment. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, our community members, please note that we have changed to a different format of accepting board comments. It is now our policy that you must submit a video of you reading your public comment uh, before each meeting the day before. And uh, there will be a link as to how to video and submit your video into a Dropbox. Following our policy, uh, the videos can be no longer than three minutes long and must include your first and last name. So every meeting that we will hold via Zoom, that is our new policy with regard to accepting and uh, communicating public comments. Uh, today's agenda uh, under public comments, we have zero submissions. Uh, but again, when we go through Zoom meetings, this will be the format that we will use. Our next order of business under presentations and discussions is our interim superintendent's presentation. So uh, Dr. Heich, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how grateful and, and uh, gratified I am that you asked me to be your interim superintendent. Um, I view this as, as quite an honor, um, and I'm anticipating it to be the capstone to a 43 and a half or 44 year career now. Uh, so just for the benefit of those of you that, that don't know, I did retire from the Farmington Public Schools um, a little over a year ago. I had been their superintendent for five years. I had been a superintendent in Avondale. Uh, public schools for eight years prior to that. And I spent a long stretch of my career in the West Bloomfield schools doing everything from being the athletic director to a middle school principal. Um, and I can tell you the very best job in our systems is to be an elementary principal because every day you go into school, somebody loves you, no matter what you've done before you walked in the building. Um, so my last uh, role, I was the interim superintendent in South Lyon from January to June. So I did experience uh, the ambiguity and the ambivalence that all of us felt when the pandemic hit and some of that pre-planning that we did in South Line to get ready uh, to prepare for the opening of school this year. So I've got uh, some understanding and background in that. And I also have been in touch with local superintendents. Um, I thought I was gonna be a superintendent coach until you called. So I was working with a couple new superintendents in local districts. So I've, I've been in that lane and in that, um, that mindset as we move forward. And I, I know that these are difficult conversations for every community to have. And I know it feels different in every community too. So to be able to understand community norms, uh, the needs of students and parents and staff, uh, as you make these decisions that you've made all the way along um, are really important. So we have a presentation that you've seen multiple times that we've added to. Um, I'm gonna ask all my team members to help me as we go through this, because there's a lot more knowledge on the team uh, than I've got to share. We do have some recommendations and I have a couple countywide conversations I wanna bring you up to date on. Um, and we did get some feedback from the Health Advisory Board um, as we make some decisions as we go forward too. So this presentation will be around the data as we know it today. Uh, the recommendation we have for a pause for the middle school uh, coming back to the hybrid and why we're recommending that and what steps we want to take to make sure we're ready. Um, and then feedback from you as a board of education. So Rachel, I think I'm ready to start trying to go through this.
So this was a timeline for our, our phased in return to hybrid. And if we follow this timeline tomorrow, uh, would be the first day we would have middle school students in with staff. We're recommending that we pause that, a very, very brief pause. And I'm gonna go through the conversation that Oakland County superintendents had with the Oakland County Health Department earlier this week as an explanation and, and to help you understand why we're recommending that pause. Um, over the weekend, Oakland County as a county uh, slipped into that final E status that they have, <clears throat> which in Oakland County is the, the status that really should be closing things down and making us all uh, more cautious. It means that for public schools, um, if you have some face-to-face -face instruction going on and you're not experiencing difficulty with it, you would like to maintain that face-to-face. Uh, but if you have programs that have not started in face-to-face, -face, <clears throat> the county's recommendation at this point is that you pause and wait to do that. But they did give us an out and a workaround around that that makes all of us feel more comfortable. So from a county standpoint, we know that we're seeing an increase in infection. We know that we're seeing an increase in uh, transmission of cases. We also know that schools are the best place for kids to be. Schools. When kids are in school, they're behaving. They're following social, social distancing. They're wearing their masks. Uh, they're taking care of hygiene the way that they should. So schools are not the transmitter of the uh, virus right now, but the activities around us in our community have expanded with social gatherings and that's causing some more transmission of the virus. And the anxiety that the health department has and public schools have is that we're gonna see a bump based on increased activity around Halloween <clears throat> that will lead into a bump from increased activity over Thanksgiving. So we continue to evaluate our COVID cases. Um, we're following all of these different data points uh, around the Michigan reopening status, our case level, the age band frequency, uh, the ability to test and trace. And even as you heard some of that conversation we were having around individuals that are waiting for test results to come back to get final decisions made. The contact tracing and the testing at the moment is not keeping up with the expansion of the virus. So we've got to help them catch that up. Our local occurrence and then other trends that we see around uh, rates of positivity, the infection spread and the new cases that we're experiencing. So we've, we're sliding between orange and red right now. And I know that you're used to that. Uh, Rachel, I might be ready for the next slide. So in our case, um, we would consider remote instruction across the district. We're gonna use the um, flexibility that the Oakland County Health Department is providing us with their guidance to maintain what we have going on and to get our middle school students back in but you'll notice districts around us. And we've got a slide that, that uh, comes to that and that volume is increasing that are making decisions either to pause or to pull back. And there are two reasons that that's happening around us. One is an increase in virus. The second is the increase in the number of adults that need to quarantine. And we're finding it very, very difficult in some of our neighboring schools to be able to staff appropriately and keep kids safe. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but last evening, Troy uh, put a pause on their high school, both at Troy High School and Troy Athens, not because of, the, of an increase in infection rate, but because of an increase in quarantine rate made it impossible for them to maintain the social distance guidelines that they've established. So here's uh, just, you know, we monitor our neighbors. Uh, we don't want to look too out of whack compared to our neighbors, we don't wanna be an outlier, but you know the Bloomfield Hills High School the other day had to uh, go to all virtual. West Bloomfield made a decision for the entire district to go to all virtual. Uh, one of the more surprising stories I heard came out of Clarkson where they've been um, aggressive with their face-to-face -face instruction appropriately so, but the number of quarantines they've had has forced them to close two of the elementary schools. Um, and they mentioned that they've had 500 students in quarantine. Um, Euron Valley went to a one week pause and they're considering. Uh, Royal Oak um, is in an all remote 
uh, position for their high school and they're reconsidering. Uh, my granddaughters in Wall Lake are supposed to go back as, in elementary starting Monday. We're waiting to hear from them. Uh, Troy made a late decision. Berkeley made a decision the other day to go to an all pause and they were on a similar schedule to us. So I'm, I'm uh, providing that as context uh, for you because I think you're gonna see uh, when we describe to you what we wanna do that we're, we're being fairly aggressive uh, for face-to-face -face instruction. Um, so this, these are all the weekly data points that we look at. You'll notice that some of those data points now have, have uh, gone further to the right. Um, and I've got everybody's picture in front of me, so I can't, I'm only seeing half the slide. But our, you know, our cases are going up. Um, we're at a higher risk level. So you see that we've put the circle between the orange and the red. Um, and we did that because we have the sense that we're sliding towards more infections. Um, and then when the Oakland County Health Department publishes their new data, uh, that we as a district will be in red uh, from a positivity standpoint. So we're currently in orange. This allows us to do the hybrid program uh, at the elementary level. It uh, recommends virtual, but gives you flexibility to move into hybrid at the middle and high school level. We're still recommending that we plan for uh, the hybrid program at the middle school level. Um, and if we slide into red, which is the next slide, um, the recommendation from really everyone is that you end up in a virtual program. So uh, Monday afternoon, we had a great conversation on a conference call with all the Oakland County superintendents and the Oakland County Health Department. And we had been in weekly conversations with the health department around uh, really two streams of thought. One is kind of a data dump. This is what's going on in the county and in areas near you. And the other one is around protocols. How does the health department help us make decisions and help inform you as the Board of Education in the community? And um, how do we safely get students in front of, front of schools, because in front of teachers? Because as we've learned through this, schools are not transmitting a disease and schools are safe places for kids to be physically and socially and mentally. So everybody has the same end product that they want between community, health department, and schools. We want kids in front of, in front of staff. We just want to be able to do it and let everybody know that it's safe and good for, good for staff and good for students. The Oakland County Health Department suggested that since we're sliding in the county into this E area and districts are sliding into uh, what we consider the red status, that a couple things happen. They did make the recommendation that if you have current programming going that involves face-to-face -face and hybrid instruction, and you're not seeing an increase in transmission, and you can staff it appropriately, you keep that program going. So in our case, that's our elementary program. So we wanna keep that going until we have to stop. And that's really the recommendation from everyone. They did say, if you've got a program that you're planning on starting soon, you probably ought to pause they want us to send them our safety mitigation plan. They want to approve it or make recommendations to us to adjust and then give us permission or suggest that it's okay to keep going with the, the middle school hybrid program. So our recommendation based on that is that we, we do not open for middle school tomorrow on the 5th, but we do submit our mitigation plan to the Oakland County Health Department they have committed to us that they'll turn those plans back around within 24 to 48 hours, either with additional requests they want us to make, or in our case, since they've already seen it and they've already thought it looks pretty good, with the okay to go and then re-implement the planning to get our middle school students in. A couple things that we're anxious about beyond um, the, the daily anxiety we carry for health and safety um, for the students and staff. One is uh, the disruption or the damage it might do to the community to do a start and a stop. You know, the, the, the potential that we can get our hybrid program rolling in the middle school and then have an explosion of virus exists and that we would be medically required to stop, right? Somebody from the state 
or someone from the county could come in and say, listen, the virus is just too hot. You can't have kids together in a school setting. We don't know if that's possible uh, or, or gonna happen, but we understand that that's a, a probability. The second anxiety we have is around what we're seeing in the area from a staffing standpoint. The ability to keep enough adults healthy and non-quarantined so we can run the programming that we ex ex expect and the community desires is also on the list. We've seen that uh, you can do it. And we've also seen that you run into bumps in a road where you can't and we just have to be ready to deal with that. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We've got the, the planning done for the middle school. You heard earlier that Dwight's completing the training uh, for that to happen. We're just suggesting it makes a lot of sense to take a deeper breath, submit the mitigation plan, get it approved by Oakland County Health Department, and then roll out the middle school program. And the, the, the pause would not be an extended pause unless the virus forced that on us, but it would be uh, uh, limited to days. So that's, that's where we're at. And I would um, ask the team right now, if, what did I miss in the presentation that uh, needs to be out there for conversation pieces? I'll just jump in on the um, one slide. We went through the, the metric side that you guys have seen a thousand times. A couple of things have changed on that um, that have been different than from before. One of those is that OCHD, um, there's a line item about our, our work with them um, that has been very strained um, over the last 10 days, I would say. Um, you guys know that I'm the point person for our COVID cases. So I'm the one that's directly talking to them um, when we have a case in any of our schools and their response time up until this point had been within 24 hours. I mean, they have been, sometimes it was three hours. It was absolutely fantastic and very reassuring for both myself and whatever building leader was associated with it. It has extended, I have um, one that, you know, despite our reaching out um, a couple more times, we're on day three of still waiting for more information. Now we've got our own procedures and we feel comfortable in, in what's occurring and that we've quarantined people on our own. But that um, communication back and forth with OCHD, which has been really important to these cases has drastically changed. So that is one of the factors that has um, changed on that slide. So I just wanted to, to get that out there as um, somebody who's worked with them closely and we're seeing that strain on our county right now and how that affects us as a district. George, I had a question. Yeah. <clears throat> What is going to be done with our, our special education programs? Will they also, because they're fully, well not yep. fully, but their program is up and running and they're staffed and they, the kids are there. Are we gonna continue the special education program as well? We do, we, we expect to continue um, all the programming we currently have in place. Okay. Until there's a medical reason um, or a state or a county order reason for us not to do it. Okay. George, I have a question for you. Yeah. So with all due respect, because I know you're just the messenger, this logic does not make sense to me. Um, so we have, we're at an E status, which seems a bit reckless, to be honest with you, that we're allowed to continue um, in person. So if schools are not the spreaders, Extending this, allowing for more sleepovers, parties, and all of that really doesn't solve for um, having middle schoolers in person. So I'm just trying to understand if schools aren't the spreaders, how are we really solving for extending the start time? So we're, we're, we don't feel like we're solving any kind of community transmission issue or anything like that. We're, we're trying to resolve the question parents and community members have of where is it best and safest and most educationally viable for students to be. And if that is in some kind of hybrid face-to-face -face model, we want to be able to provide that. And if we can provide that in a manner that doesn't endanger students and doesn't endanger staff, um, we kind of feel like we have an obligation to, to try to do it. And then I guess for me too, um, thank you, George. So can we get an update on our current staffing? Cause you referenced staffing 
And then how are things going for elementary school? I guess what I'm struggling with is it's okay for elementary students to be in school, but not middle schoolers. That's what I'm really struggling yeah, with. Yeah, that's, that's fair. So it was that kind of a, a rhetoric? Yeah, it was a question and a statement. And maybe you're okay. not able to, you know, I see Dean yeah. coming on, so maybe he can give Thank us you. a staffing issue okay. because I know we have to have the staff to be able to move forward with this. And then if we could also get an update on the elementary schools, has there been any, out any outbreaks in elementary? Yeah. Those two questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of staffing, we are um, we're maintaining right now at the elementary level. Um, we are having some periodic quarantines that we've had to deal with. Um, just this week, one of the changes that also came from guidance with um, the Oakland Health Department was we originally believed that if there was a COVID positive case in the home of one of our employees that they would be an employee, for example, would have to quarantine for 14 days. The nurses from Oakland County made it pretty clear that that is actually not sufficient, that if one of our employees has a member of their home who is COVID positive and they are having any part to do with the caregiving, they will have to wait the 10 days of quarantine that the COVID positive family member has. And then they will have to wait an additional 14 days themselves to make sure there's no chance that they catch it during the period that is most likely for them to catch it. So we just moved from essentially about a two week quarantine from having to find substitutes to potentially three weeks or more. Um, and that is actually affecting a couple people right now in the district that were due back and we wound up having to extend them and which put more strain on finding subs that we thought we had covered and then we had to scramble to find subs. Um, we are facing some situations on a regular basis where we do not have subs and we have to scramble and patch it with other people within the building. Um, so it is not, um, it is not perfect unless by, by any means. We're, we're kind of right on the edge. Um, I do have uh, someone who I brought back in, um, as you remember, Audra Melton, who used to work with us to do some work and, and uh, as the interim curriculum director, I brought her back in to help me out in human resources for a while to primarily focus on hiring building subs. We are making some progress on that. It's taking a little while longer. Um, so we're hoping to add some more subs, but uh, you know, one of the challenges with subs is, um, you know, we, uh, that pool itself got drained because many subs often tend to be retired or in age categories and other categories that they don't wanna put themselves at risk. So many people who traditionally have subbed for us in the past have taken themselves off the uh, availability list as well too. So. We are maintaining. Um, in terms of the middle school, we were mostly staff. We had one late um, person going on a leave of absence that we now have to find uh, coverage for. And um, one of the challenges we will have, as George stated, um, you know, we have to, particularly at the secondary level, um, find qualified people um, with their certifications if any type of uh, long term absence is going to happen. So that will be one of the challenges uh, that we will have ongoing. And if, um, you know, I can address it in regards to the high school, but just in terms of where we are with the elementary and middle school, that's, you know, kind of covers what I just said. So I don't know if that answers your questions or if you have any other. It does, thank you. So then I guess the follow-up question would be, how does this um, affect all virtual then? Are, do we still have staffing issues? How are you gonna work around that? Um, we are staffed, you know, for, uh, you know, right now, anybody who is virtual in terms of the elementary, we are staffed for that. We do have one opening we're trying to fill um, of someone who will be going on a leave of absence. So we are still working on that. Um, if we have to switch to any type of virtual, I mean, you're essentially switching what you have now into virtual teaching. So, um, so at the moment we are covered. Um, but again, that could, that could certainly change. I mean, one of the realities of virtual is even if someone is quarantining and they can teach virtual, it doesn't matter. The, the, the challenge we would have is if someone um, has to quarantine because of their own health issue and they become ill and are able to teach um, when, when they're virtual. So it's uh, something we haven't had to deal with yet. I'm, I'm hoping we don't, but we have to be realistic that that could happen. Dean, can I ask a question? Yes. So um, 
as we look at staffing, um, especially at the high school level, if we know we're going to be short, is there a way to um, look at using some of the approved true virtual programs that our high school students already use and to ask, you know, if kids are willing to select those to alleviate some of the, you know, pressure on having to have, for example, I don't know, five math teachers when maybe you only have four. Do you mean specific things like Michigan Virtual or other programs like that? Michigan Virtual. Those programs are filled um, and they weren't taking any more students in those programs. That was earlier in the fall that was identified that there was no room in those programs statewide. Even for like the next try? Uh, that I don't know. I would. Um, I thought that was in the fall. Y yes, you are correct. In the fall, it was it was full. Um, we haven't explored a mass uh, move to having students um, take Michigan virtual classes, um, but that's something that we can look into. But in the fall, it did fill up. Um, yeah. Is Khan Academy included into like a, a the same level as Michigan Virtual? No, um, and one of the things that we want to make sure that we have um, options for our students that are approved and accredited, both for their college transcripts and also for um, NCAA for those athletes as well. And Khan Academy would not be one of them, and so really that in mind um, we're looking at options for students. Um, can I ask George just a few other questions um, from the presentation? So Oakland County Health Department has acknowledged that schools are not the transmitters, meaning that the spread doesn't start in the classroom. We might have people in classrooms who get it, but it's happening outside of the classroom, correct? Correct. Okay. So given that, sorry, then, and given that our, at this point, hospital capacity still looks okay, and um, that certainly some of the younger age bands aren't in the same, you know, categories as some of the older age bands, um, I, I guess I'm going to go a little bit back to Nicole's point that it actually seems like we are keeping them out of a safer environment to leave them in a less safe environment. And if Oakland County Health is putting these restrictions on public schools, are they also speaking to private schools? Or well, I, I would suspect they are having conversations with private schools also. I don't know that for a fact. Um, and I would suspect that a private school would reach out to the health department for guidance if they felt like they needed it. Um, but they don't have the same kind of influence, if that's a, an appropriate word to use. Uh -huh. But I feel like they do over a, a public school district. Um, okay. And then also, I'm curious about the teacher quarantines. Because um, part of what we looked at with the health advisory board was making sure that our PPE for teachers was, you know, CDC plus in terms of they have plexiglass, um, you know, they have six feet of space. That's why we're not talking about sending all the kids back in the classroom because that would not afford us six feet right. of space, right? Um, and the kids are all wearing masks. Both Adrian and I were in classrooms with, um, third and fourth graders last week. And I was amazed at how compliant they were. No issues with keeping the mask on, um, which I, you would think if third and fourth graders can do it, certainly <laughs> the older kids can do it. So is the, quor the quarantine is mainly happening with teachers then again, not because they're contracting it or being exposed to it at school, but because they're being exposed to it in their home or other is correct yeah i just wanted to jump in there that yeah this is not we have not had we had one case where there was a staff member that was under quarantine for a special circumstance um 
within the school, but um, the, all, the, all of the other ones, there has not been a teacher that's been put in quarantine following a, a positive case in our schools. I think that needs to be made pretty clear to um, you know, our, our public, because I think when they hear teachers are in quarantine, they automatically move to, oh, the teachers were exposed, but through a student. Because like, I, I, I think <laughs> certainly at the middle school and high school levels, there should be very little less than six feet exposure between students and staff. I, I get it at elementary, you might have situations where a teacher has to intervene a little bit more in a physical manner, but we designed our protocols to essentially eliminate to the extent possible the exposure factor and everything I've read on the cases we have had from Oakland County Health Department seems to indicate that that's working. So I guess I don't know that I have a point here other than to say I want to make it abundantly clear that to our community that we are not spreading this in our schools. No, Amy, I think it's a good point to lift up. I mean, you said they should be relatively low in middle school, and maybe I misunderstood you. I mean, they should be zero because middle school is still all virtual. No, but I meant once we send them back, like, you know, the teachers behind plexiglass, the, the kids are all six foot distance. I, I mean, I suppose there are going to be certain situations in hallways and maybe, you know, when a student needs some extra help where there's a little bit more um, close contact. But for the most part, we've designed it so there will not be. Right, and that's mitigation strategies that I'm assuming, George, we will be submitting to Oakland County Health Department. Yep, we will be. And I just like to point out that some of those schools on the list that we put up, they are not doing six feet of distance between kids. So Clarkston yep. cannot guarantee that because they have put all kids back in classrooms. I'm not sure about Huron Valley, quite honestly. Um, they have a hybrid program, I think, so I'm assuming it's six feet, but I don't really know. Um, and I, I mean, Bloomfield Hills is hybrid. They're certainly, I, theirs is more related to the teacher quarantine. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thanks. That well, would conclude my portion of the, of the updates. I have another quick question. So middle schoolers um, are currently trying out for sports. And so what is that? Are they still going to be able to do sports or what would be our policy around that? So we're, we're currently following the Michigan High School Athletic Association guidelines, which does allow for winter sports with um, kind of enhanced safety measures um, in place. I would anticipate we would continue following that, but I'm, I'm looking for help from the team to <laughs> That's George, I'll, I'll, I can jump in on that one. Thank we you. just had an athletics meeting. And so while we are in orange, um, that continues to be the same in terms of the MHSAA guidance. If uh, everyone were to move to a, more of a red state, and I use those terms differently than the E, the overall E, which has um, a wide breadth there, even within the, the letter grade E, that if we were to go to red like before, then all athletics would likely cease, but we are not there yet, so. Um, Thank you. I'm just gonna make one comment about that because um, I, I know that somebody's gonna be mad at me for making this comment, but if we get to making a choice between educating children or giving them the opportunity to participate in sports, we need to be making the right choice there. Mm -hmm. So sending kids back hybrid and limiting or eliminating athletics is a better solution than keeping kids home and letting them play athletics, correct? Amy, that's gonna be a board decision. And so um, 
I'll hearken back to the beginning of the framework as it was introduced and say that the board would need to take a look at those frameworks. And if you have differing views on that, that would be something you'd work with George on to change. Um, and, and I hear what you're saying, and we certainly have heard from community members similar concerns about how do we toggle between what uh, community members and parents feel are really essential opportunities to keep kids engaged, but then is, is there dual messaging that we're able to do that through MHSAA through some kind of a perceived loophole, but not be able to do that for school. So I'd invite the board to have further discussion um, about that aspect of the framework if that's still coming up. Well, I mean, my concern is that the majority of fall sports were you know, outdoors, which mitigated that spread. But when we talk about basketball, volleyball, um, you know, then you're talking indoors. And um, to me, that ups the level of risk. But not really. Um, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I appreciate and respect that, Amy. I guess for people who are in sports, it's for mental well-being. It's something that they want to be a part of. I, although I don't know how we justify allowing sports and not school. So I agree with you there. Um, but with sports, if they're playing with a mask, I mean, it's the same as them being in school with a mask. And it's actually fewer students than if they were in school. Because a team, for, for example, a basketball team has maybe 10 players and the opposing team has 10. So we're talking about 20 students versus hundreds of students in a school um, well, with masks. So I mean, to true, me, that's a difference. Yeah, but the contact is much closer Yeah, on the court. And, and the consciousness is contained. You know, when you're, when you're in a, a gymnasium, that's a contained space. Whereas if your contact on a soccer field or a football field, you're out in the open air. So it's not as contained. I, I mean, I, I worry about that. And Nicole, you also mentioned that I don't know what it's going to look like to the community that if we allow sports and not have school, that is going to be one, another area. I mean, but a classroom is more contained is contained is tighter than a basketball court. But the kids are distanced. They're socially distanced. Their desks are. They're, um, they've been taught to keep this social distance, but you can't do that in a sport. I, I don't think we need to solve this here. I would like for kids to be in school and able to participate in sports. Mm -hmm. My comment was just that we've already heard from community members that you know, if sports are um, a source of spreading, that we have to place education ahead of that. And George, I do think um, the Oakland County Health Department has indicated that there are 12 districts in Oakland County that have had spread related to sports, correct? They, they have indicated that, that athletics has been a, a spreader um, you know, they don't pinpoint it just to the school athletics, but they also talk about youth leagues and, and other activities like that. Sure. So I'll, I'll just end this portion since we're talking about middle school athletics. I, I do have a, a grandson that played eighth grade basketball last year in Farmington. And there were times he was socially distant from whoever he was supposed to be guarding and frustrated the heck out of me. <laughs> well, and you know, George, I have an eighth grader who is currently in the process of trying out for basketball. And it will be devastating, not only to him, but to other boys who have looked forward to this moment. And I do understand, I don't understand, I mean, I do understand people's concern for allowing for sports and not school. However, right now, what I'm struggling with is how is it okay for elementary students to go to school and not middle school? Correct. Yep, we're gonna and work. Well, but before we turn, we're, we're only putting a pause on middle school. We're not saying middle school can't go back. We're gonna follow the recommendations of Oakland County Health Department, submit our mitigation strategy, get feedback, and then hopefully middle school can still come out. But that's the same thing. I mean, it's we're pausing it for a month, but we're allowing uh -huh. elementary. No. Where'd you get a no. month? This, this would be a, this would be a pretty brief pause. 
We're okay, so when when are we talking about going back then? Well, I thought I saw December first. What did I see? On that's the high school. Well, well, yeah, that, oh, okay. that would, yeah, that'd be high school. So our, our intention is to submit the plan to Oakland County Health Department uh, today or tomorrow, have them okay. turn around within a day or two, and then implement that middle school reentry plan. Oh, got it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Can I ask what's different about is it just because we're level E that you want to take this this extra caution? It is. Oh, okay. it, 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 two things, it, to be fair, Adrian. It, one, we're in level E and the transmission rate is in mm -hmm. our communities are going up. Um, mm -hmm. Our adult staff is watching districts around us kind of go the other direction. Um, in the Oakland County Health Department, as soon as they offered this, I felt like it would make adults within the community feel a little more secure about our reentry plan that the County Health Department had reviewed and approved it. Mm -hmm. And to Ann's point earlier about the delays in this department, I mean, we can expect that we are talking about a delay at least through the remainder of this week. And then with the half day schedule we have for next week, I mean, we are talking about a delay of probably over a week. Is that fair to say? I, I need help with that, to be honest with you. No, that's fine. I. I'm not 100% down on the schedule either, but I yeah, want to say I the 10th and 11th or half days or something like that. And I don't know, Adrian, honestly, it, I don't know if who they have working on the mitigation plan discussions are. Okay. Oh, are the same people versus, who are responding to the, yeah. Right. So this will okay. be, you know, we'll find out, but we're, we know that we have the information and we're ready to go on our end. With okay. And then the other thing I want to clarify for the community is this is the plan, right? This is what you're doing. So we are yes. not as a board voting on whether you, on whether we agree to delay, you are coming to us today and saying, given that we're Oakland County level E, we are submitting a plan, we're getting extra approval, um, that's happening period full stop. Yes, absolutely correct. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Adrian. No, I'm, I'm done, that's all. I was just going to emphasize your point that this is, and I know that we've voted multiple times and talked about different plans along the way, but this is what we agreed to back in August. If we were to shift to whatever a county or state um, levels dictate that we would shift to that. And so just emphasizing your Thank point. You. That, yeah, that, no, that's, that's really helpful. So this decision is in line with the plan that we approved um, so we need not, and, and because this is a study session, we're not voting. That's a great point, John. So it is a mutual decision. It's just our decision came months ago when we approved Correct. the, yeah. Thank you for uh, that clarification. Yeah, I, I feel like this recommendation lives into your plan. That's why I just wanted to highlight to the community. It's not something that we're again, voting on again, discussing. We mm -hmm. voted on this back in August and it's just, we're at that point now with the county that this is what we have to do. To move forward and doesn't this also fit in with our process of reviewing every single month how online is going how hybrid is going how i mean we've we've made a pledge to take a look at this i mean and we look at the numbers every week and then every month we come back and have to make a decision doesn't that fit with the same process well, the, well, the monthly review is statutory and the, the weekly review and upkeep with data is something that we have incorporated into the Birmingham Public Schools plan. So they're, they're different. I mean, they definitely, there's overlap, but I don't know. And, uh, Dr. Yeah, they're, 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 the difference is, is that we have to actually vote or excuse me, you have to actually vote on, on the plan on a monthly basis, which you just voted um, at the last board meeting. So you're still reviewing, but the difference in this particular situation is, is we're having a conversation about what you voted on a few months ago and that it's just being enacted because the cases have increased. Um, so it's a little different than when you actually have to vote and say, yes, we wanna continue this plan, which you do at a regular board session.
Dr. Heisch, um, you mentioned you um, met with the health advisory board. Did they have a strong opinion about what to do or is this part of their recommendation? Well, we, we asked for feedback uh, that came to Ann yesterday and they were, um, they were open to this happening. The, you know, they were the ones that really emphasized how safe students were in school. Uh, they emphasize that we know more than we did when we started uh, the conversation a while ago, uh, that the, the disease is being transmitted in the community, not through schools, uh, that we want to maximize as much time in school as we can, and that we should try to avoid disruptions, well, no matter how we, we move forward, if we could. And, and Anne, I know you've got more to add. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I just want to start by saying that the health advisory board, remember their role was to develop the metrics. So we have not um, asked them to provide an opinion necessarily on us returning or not, but they did provide some good points of where we should be looking, which is what we're looking at, that positivity rate, that um, uh, they did talk a little bit about the consistency for mental health sake of, you know, kind of maybe bouncing back and forth and what that does. Um, which aligns with the pause, the brief pause to make sure that we get this right so that we're not putting them in for two days and then pulling them back out in a week. Um, so there was those conversations too, but it, overall, you know, they, they are very comfortable with the metrics that we settled upon. Um, and those are the ones that we're watching going forward. So I, I think, um, you know, we, we've put together some thoughts on what they have and I think that George summarized it well. Thank you, that's very helpful. Trustees, anything else? Going once, so okay. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Heisch. We'll now move on uh, for the community to agenda item number two, <clears throat> excuse me, under presentations discussion, which is the BPS school grades. Thank you, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, today I wanted to just, as part of the study session, um, talk about school grades, which is um, part of the Michigan accountability system. The Michigan accountability system governs all traditional public schools and public charter schools. And the purpose of today's um, portion of the study session is to understand and review the past history of the BPS school grades. And this is in preparation for the 2019 2020 school grades that will be released um, November 6. Um, so just in a, in a couple of days. And to also um, understand the next steps that we have in monitoring student achievement. And I say this because when we, uh, as we go through this presentation and talk about school grades, um, school grades are just one part of how we look at our, our schools. Um, we really need to look at our schools in, in a holistic view because the school grades in itself don't tell the entire story of how our schools are doing. So the Michigan accountability system, and you know what, I can't see everybody. So at any time, if you have a question, just unmute and, and stop me and ask a question. But the Michigan accountability system has two major parts of it. Um, there's the school grades portion, and then there's the school index and transparency dashboard. Now, I will tell you that um, the components that I'm going to talk about around the school grades are all based on four assessments. The M-STEP, which is given to our students third through eighth grade. The um, My Access, which is given to some of our students with disabilities um, in third through eighth grade um, and also 11th grade. The PSAT. Uh, for eighth grade and the SAT for 11th grade. So those are the assessments um, uh, scores that the components are based on in the areas of English language arts and mathematics. So as part of the school grades, they look at student proficiency, so just overall how students are performing, student growth, whether they have grown um, from the previous year and so for instance, in third grade that they won't have that information, but by fourth grade, they can look at how that student uh, performed in third grade compared to how they performed in fourth grade. They look at the graduation rate um, trends um, in our high schools. 
they look at performance among peers. And what this means is actually performance among peer schools. So they take schools, um, each one of our schools, and they uh, compare it to 30 other schools that are similar in demographics and determine how well the schools are doing in comparison to their quote unquote like schools. They look at the English learner progress, um, our student subgroup performance and our student subgroups for instance would be um, our students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged students, uh, our African American students, um, our assessment participation, so how many students actually took the assessments, and then overall attendance. Out of these components for school grades, five of them are also the same components that they use to create the school index and transparency dashboard. Now, I'm not going to go into the details about the school index and transparency dashboard, but I bring this um, to your attention um, for the following reasons. There um, is disagreement um, in our, um, between our, our government and our State Board of Education about the use of the school grades. So the school grades were redesigned at the end of 2018 with the support of the governor, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and the Senate Majority Leader. However, the Michigan State Board of Education and the Michigan Department of Education do not believe that the school grades are necessary because they're both using some of the same components. And the Department of Education believes that the school grades have oversimplified really what we should be looking at for schools. Um, however, school grades are still part of our, our accountability system. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention because there are some um, differences in terms of how people think we should look at school grades. And that's why it's important, as you'll see later on in the presentation, that we use this as one piece, but we also look at other measures to determine how our schools are doing. So in the, like I said, in 2008, at the end of 2018, they revamped the school grades. In the spring of 2019, they gave the assessments, the MSTEP, the PSAT, the SAT. And then at some point during the 2019-2020 school year, or last school year, um, they released the 2018-19 grades. And we had some celebrations. Some of our celebrations are that all of our schools received an A grade in, for proficiency which means all of our students met the mark overall from the state of what is proficient. Um, because of this, all of our schools consider reward, are considered um, a reward school, which is a high achieving school because, they, because we received an A in one of the areas. 12 of our 13 schools received an A grade for student growth with one receiving a B grade. Both Groves and Home received a graduation grade of an A. So those are some things that we um, could celebrate about our 2018-19 school grades. Where were our opportunities for growth? Um, there were definitely opportunities for growth in our peer comparisons. So again, those are that's when they take a, a school, one of our schools, and they compare it to 30 other schools that um, are similar. They look at enroll, I say similar in some ways, they look at enrollment, students with disability and students who receive free or reduced lunch. So they're looking at the economic um, status of a particular school. And when looking at our rankings in those areas, um, we would expect that some of our schools would have done better. Um, receiving a C grade, for instance, is saying that you're average with your peer comparisons. And we would expect for Birmingham that and you know that we would be at minimum and uh, a C grade or higher um, at minimum. And so there are opportunities because we weren't in all in all of our schools, there are opportunities for growth there. In your report, there is um, a chart that has all of the data in your report, but parents are also able to find these scores on the parent transparency uh, report, which I have a link to it at the end of this presentation. Vika, can I interrupt yes. you for a minute? Can you go back one slide? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, one more, this slide or one more? No, no, this is, this is the one I, where I have a question. It says 12 out of the 13 schools received an A grade and one received a B grade. And this is for student growth. So yes. am I to assume that this one school didn't show or didn't um, have enough student growth that warranted the B grade? And, and if so, what school is it? And we know we do know that we've got to work on, on improving that school. Right, so the state gives a target for how much a student should grow from year to year. Um, and within that target, they have a target for what would be considered a, an A grade of growth, what would be mm -hmm. the B grade growth and so forth. And so um, uh, the school that received the B grade was Corton Elementary. And um, again, you know, um, there's definitely some improvement, um, not only at Corton at all of our schools, because the other piece in all of this, and uh, I'll get to that in terms of, and one, if we don't have all of our students at proficiency, we have room for growth mm -hmm. and, um, and we don't. Um, we also don't want to use just the state standards as um, our, our goal, our minimum goal, because they're, they're lower than what we should expect in Birmingham. And so, yes, there is a growth that needs to happen there, but also at, at, at all of our schools in some form or fashion. Dr. Robeson, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Yes. So when you talk about student growth, are we talking about like, um, you know, when you get your NWEA students report and there's that, um, here, here's how they did this year and then the projection, or is that what- So we're looking at- But you're talking about individual student growth. They look at the individual student growth for, for instance, they're looking at, this is the imp, like imp for the Corden, for instance, or any of our elementary schools, it would be the imp step. Okay. And so the state says, okay, for um, the imp step, we looked at third, and I'm, they do this for each one of the grade levels. We look at, we're looking at the student's third grade projection. I mean, third grade performance should be an adequate amount of growth for their uh, piece for fourth grade. And then whether or not they hit that mark collectively. And then they look at an average of what does the average growth of that particular school look like and determine whether or not they've hit the mark for, a, you know, an A, a B. Right. So, so in other words, like 90% of students have to hit it to get an A or something like that. Right. So right. what we're saying here is that a subset of Quarton third graders didn't experience the growth they were projected to and it wouldn't be yeah and it wouldn't be just the third graders would be also it would be every grade they would look at every grade level so okay across the board growth, okay. it actually looks at fourth and fifth because they don't have any baseline data for the third graders so they look at fourth and fifth now the other thing that we do need okay. to keep in mind is this is one assessment so this is just the m step so right you know we again you know, I would say all of our school, stu, schools need um, proof in some way, but also making sure that we are not taking one data point and painting it for the whole picture of a particular school or for the district, because there are, we should look at multiple data, data points. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you asked that question, Amy. That, that helps me understand better too. So for the 2019-20 grades, they will be released on November 6th. And the reason that I wanted to do this presentation is because I wanted to make sure that you had awareness of the school grades, um, especially because on November 6th, they become public. I'm not allowed to share what they are right now because they're embargoed until November 6th. But I realized that um, this is the last meeting that we will have prior to that, that information becoming public. Since all assessments were waived statewide in spring of 2020, which is what they use to calculate a lot of these indicators, there's only three indicators that's going to affect our school grades this year. That's going to be graduation rate, because they look at graduation rate, not just for the, um, the end of 2020, um, spring of 2020, but also uh, a three to five year trend. 
It will also be the English learner progress. And that's because our WIDA test was given in February and March, so just prior to the shutdown for COVID, and then attendance. So those will be the three things that when you see the 2019, 2020 school grades come out, those will be the only three categories that you will see information on. Um, now, we do expect because this year, um, as of right now, the waiver that was put in by the state um, Department of Education was denied for the spring of 2021. We will be taking all of those assessments. And so those school grades, all of those components will likely um, be in play um, for, for this school year. Dr. Roberson, I have a quick question. So regarding attendance, would that just be our average that we had for the virtual um, learning from March through June? Will they so take the average it, or how will they figure that? Yeah, I, I, my understanding is this going to be from September, basically until March is what they're gonna use the attendance participation on. Great, thank you. Yeah. So because the school grades tell one story, so in one aspect we say, yay, we have some celebrations, but at the same time, again, we should not use one data point as our full picture. We should not um, use actually what the state targets are as our goal because their state targets are um, lower than what we should expect you know, from, from our, uh, our community. And so we have an assessment calendar that puts things in place for us so that we can monitor this information. For elementary, we use the FMP reading assessment as well as literacy um, footprints, uh, writing assessments, words their way inventory, math unit assessments. This year we did NWEA for K through eight. Um, that had to be done by October 30th for um, all of our students in, um, English language arts and mathematics. And, um, and then we do the WIDA test, which is the test for English learners. Um, for secondary, we will be monitoring the final exams, AP assessments. The NWEA, we did six through eight at the secondary level. PSAT and SAT, um, they actually, we offered this to our students in the fall. Um, and we will also be offering it again in the spring. Um, you'll see SAT says 11th and 12th grade. Usually it's only 11th grade, but we offered it to our 12th graders this fall um, for those students who weren't able to take it this past spring as 11th graders. And then at, uh, as well, the, the WIDA assessment again is something that is uh, given to our English learners um, at the secondary level. Um, we do want to still provide, um, we're still looking at providing interventions for our students that are ac academically struggling or our students that are underserved where we often see our gaps. And while, and this is another reason why I say the school grades doesn't tell the whole story, um, we have high marks for our subgroup populations. Um, and those high marks on, a school, on the school grades report for the, our subgroup populations is because they compare our subgroup populations to the state subgroup populations. But it doesn't compare our students to our own students. And so we still see gaps there. And so that's why I say that it's really important that we dig deeper um, to make sure that we are addressing um, concerns within our own data to make sure that all of our students are doing well. We have a BEF uh, grant for tutoring that our teaching and learning department is working on right now to um, look at the gather the fall data and look at that and de uh, help determine students that or identify students that may need help for tutoring. Across the district, we have some of our schools that are using a lunch bunch that are getting some of our hybrid students and our virtual students together virtually um, to get, get support to. Um, one of our middle school has a, a virtual academic resource center that's offering tutoring for students. Um, also after school, and of course, we are still providing reading support um, for our students uh, across the district. 
Dr. Roberson, real quick question. When you say that there's a gap between subgroups, um, how does it compare to previous years? Have you seen the gap widen or is it similar? So our data for our subgroup data is, is, is old because it's based on you know, last assessment that we had, um, that we were able to look at it the spring of 2019. And so our data for this past year because of COVID has been really, um, we, we don't have that. What we're going to look at now is this fall data, which some of it was just completed October 30th, gathering that together and comparing what does that data to look like in comparison to our old data from 2019. So that information will come in a future study session because we're gathering that fall information now. Um, okay. 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 But thank you. We have so many varying factors to compare with. I mean, it, it's, I don't know how you compare online learning or, or um, virtual learning with being in the classroom learning face-to-face. -face. Oh, I, I, I agree, Lori. There's a, um, Trustee Agiluni, there's gonna be a lot of um, things that we're gonna to have to keep in mind as considerations. Mm -hmm. Things that I do think we can look at, for instance, is what does our overall achievement look like in comparison to previous overall achievement? Mm -hmm. We see differences there. Then we, of course we can consider that there's going to be differences also with our subgroup populations as well. So I, I, I think is it going to be comparing um, complete apples to apples? You're absolutely right. It's not going to be comparing apples to apples because of uh, the two different environments in which students are, are being taught. But I think that there are still some um, important um, information. Uh, there's important information that we still can glean from looking at the data overall and with our subgroup populations in comparison to our, our, old, our old data. The other thing that we will have to keep in mind is that um, some of our students were able to take some of these assessments um, in school and some of them took them at home. That also plays a role in how um, students performed as well. So there, there are a lot of pieces and variables that will change um, and again, you know, make comparison uh, difficult. Um, but I still think that there's important information that we can glean to help um, you know, put processes in place that will help our students. Okay, um, there's, I also have a follow-up question. So Dr. Roberson, how much leeway do we have as a public school to modify our grading system? So the school grades are, the, are um, mandated by the state of Michigan. So are you, are you talking about the school grades that I'm talking about now, or are you talking about more so our um, local grades that we give to students at the end of a car marking? Local grades, I should have said that. So we do have leeway um, in looking at how we um, grade students and what we use. One of the things um, that we would want to do is not only look at that from a district perspective, but also get teachers involved to have that conversation as well as making sure that anything that we, any changes or anything that we put in place um, still allows our students to be competitive at the university level when they're um, entering school and also allows, um, doesn't allow any negative consequences for our students who also are um, athletes who use their grades to be eligible. Um, for, for college scholarships and, and to play. Let's see that. Dr. Roberson, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lori. Okay, thanks, I'll, I'll, this is my last question. Then you That's can, fine. See, I think here's where we run into like a trap and that is unless universities change their admittance requirements and, and um, their admittance process we are trapped into, these, into this conventional, traditional grading system. And there are very few universities that look at a more holistic admittance. And I, I just wish that we could start having those conversations and maybe bring universities along with us at some point. I don't know, is that too 
out there? No, I do think that there are a lot of conversations that we, you're, you're right, there are some things that we are going to have hands tied unless we get um, higher education um, involved, but there are other things that, that can be done with our grades um, that may be more reasonable um, for us to, you know, for us to do to have a, a system that really looks at students who, how they're doing as a standard and, you know, what are we really grading in students' grades. Uh, a follow-up to that, I'm sorry, Amy, um, a follow-up to that would be, I think, because data does tell a story, I think it would be helpful if in the future we could have um, an analysis of how our students have performed academically during the pandemic to see if there are some trends there. Well, and to see how they compare to pre prior to the pandemic. Okay, we can do that. Lori, relative to your previous comment, I will say that um, because I have a senior who's going through the application process, colleges are being um, slightly more forgiving and creative in their um, application reviews due to COVID and um, we already know the University of California system is instead of being test optional, they're actually not looking at test scores at all to level the playing field. So I do think that there's um, some good coming out of the whole COVID experience because it is forcing colleges to recognize that, you know, when some kids can take five ACTs and others can't even get into one, it's not a fair assessment of progress. So I think we're gonna start seeing a little bit more of that. Hopefully, maybe it's gonna take two or three years because they're gonna have to see how the classes that they matriculated without as many test scores do, but I'm hopeful that it'll come. But see, I think that's, that's a great start to reevaluating their, their whole admittance process and, and maybe these changes that they're trying to that they're making now because of COVID will become mm -hmm. permanent you know maybe they'll have a, a better um, more holistic is how I keep thinking of it well sad that it took a pandemic for right. them to be forced right. to look at it though exactly exactly thank you Dr. Roberson very much mm -hmm. very thank you so, so in regards to our next steps, um, and I want to just shift because we talked about two different types of grades, our grades for our students at the end of card marking and in our school grades that we get from the state of Michigan. Our, ne our next steps for, for the data piece is one, analyzing the fall data, which we have again from both our local assessments and NWEA, which just finished on October 30th. Um, continue to implement interventions. We will monitor the progress on our goals um, because as part of, uh, um, if you recall, you voted on um, our, our goals of using our NWA as baseline data and looking at how we're going to improve um, in, in achievement for English language arts and mathematics for this school year. Um, I will continue to come back either myself or someone from our department to share information with the board around our data and around our goals and all of the information that uh, was shared with you in this PowerPoint in terms of um, how our schools are doing also um, on, our, on the state of Michigan's parent dashboard, which I put the website here. Um, and, and that ends the uh, presentation. Um, you know, we had a questions along the way, but if anyone has some additional questions, I can answer that for you now. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, again, I just wanted to make sure that you were abreast, especially because before something becomes public and you like, where did this come from? I just wanna make sure that you guys are abreast and we will continue to keep you um, informed um, from month to month. Thank you. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Robertson, thank you. Yo. Nicole, did you have something or Justin? I just said thank you. 
Okay, trustees, that brings us to the end of the formal agenda. Anything else before we adjourn? Kim, I, I just have one comment. Um, you know, I, I, I think that we, we need to be looking down the line with, um, you know, Oakland County asking us to submit mitigation procedures. I'm thinking that we need to be looking at the spring and what kinds of things we're gonna be able to do in the spring that will help us ensure that we can keep kids in school. Um, we talked about it a lot in the fall and we never really did it, but I, I would like to us, for us to commit to looking at utilizing outdoor spaces in the spring um, and finding ways to make sure that um, activities can be held outside as much as possible. Um, I know there are a ton of clubs at both Sea Home and Groves that are still virtual and you know, possibly they could be meeting outside if they don't mind the cold. Um, but I, I just think we really need to have um, foresight to what is coming, especially if we're looking at these winter months and Oakland County moving us into these high risk categories. I'd like to commit to keeping kids in school as much as possible, but also coming up with better ways to make sure the spring looks better. Got it. And I wrote it down, Amy, so we'll continue to discuss it. Um, Thank you. Dr. Heisch, one last question. Sorry, I'm going back up to the, um, the mitigation plan. Does that when we submit that, are we submitting it only for middle school or does that cover all K through 12? So I guess where I'm going, instead of leading the witness, where I'm going with this is do we see any right now, remaining where we are from a county perspective, do we see any delay in the December 1st high school back to school? So I, I'm gonna answer that in two parts. We, we anticipate uh, submitting the mitigation plan as a, um, PK-12 document. So it covers all of the plans that we have in place. Um, we will continue forward with the planning for the December 1st uh, re-entry with high school, you know, with the understanding that life around us may alter that. Thank you. I have a quick question. How, um, so I'm sure we're gonna communicate to, or what kind of communication will we have to families? Now, one thing I can tell you, Dr. Heisch, is that my neighbor contacted me because her elementary son came home with all of his belongings. For hmm. some reason, he thought that they were not going to be returning to elementary school. And I'm just wondering if there needs to be some communication around that. And, and uh, there's Joan, or there's Ann. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got to communicate. In fact, I'm going to hit send on this as to you guys so that you see it first. But it talks about how our elementary change, it won't, won't change elementary or the BCS 3-4 right now. It's simply the delay right now. I also have included information regarding what our mitigation plan looks like for people to understand what it is that we already have in place so that they know that we are prepared to go forward with that mitigation plan. Um, and then I also give people the information about, you know, our flow charts and everything else just to give some more um, background there. But there's a, there's a full communication that will go out, I hope, before noon today. I should have known you were on top of it, Anne. Thank you. I, I try. <laughs> Okay, trustees, anything else? Okay, um, as a reminder to the community, next week is our second study session for November. It's November 10th at 6 p.m. Uh, we will communicate and post whether it will be live at Groves Auditorium or via a Zoom meeting. Um, other than that, trustees going once, going twice. Thank you everyone and again, welcome Dr. Heisch. Um, and we are officially adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye, everyone.